morning, everybody, and welcome to our latest podcast series today. I'm warmly welcoming Professor Shane Kilcommons, who is affiliated with the School of Law here at the University of Limerick. He has recently been appointed Executive Dean of our faculty, the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. So Shane, I want to congratulate you on your new role. Thank you very much, Michelle. Shane's areas of expertise focus on criminal law, evidence law, criminal procedure penology and legal philosophy. He has served as head of department, the School of Law since 2014, and he sits on a wide range of university reviews and committees. Shane is also a Fulbright scholar, so I know this will appeal to many of you listening to the podcast today. He was appointed an expert with European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Inhumane or Degrading Treatment of pun or Punishment. And he also worked as part of a team of inspectors for the inspector of prisons and being invited by the then Minister of Justice, Francis Fitzgerald, to chair the Consultative Council. More recently, in 2020, Shane was appointed to the Angorda Shekana Expert Review Group on Recruit Education and Entry Pathways and Learning and Development. So we're eager to hear more about this as well today, Shane. This really was the aim to provide strategic advice and make recommendations on the delivery of learning and development interventions within the organization of Angor the Shikana. Shane has a wide range of experience in supervising uh, PhD students and he's obtained approximately 2.6 million in competitive funding. So Shane, we welcome you today to this podcast series. We're delighted that you've made time in your busy schedule to be with us today. So Shane, I might start off by just asking all of our listeners are eager to learn more about where your research area stems from. You know, how did you come about um, attracting into this particular um, area of discipline? So you might want to share that with us first today. I'm delighted to share this with you, Michelle, and actually it, it may be reassuring for people as well. I kind of fell into my research area and actually it was through the mistakes that I was making that that process of going down wrong pathways that I eventually fell on the correct pathway. And I, I suppose to begin with, I had finished my undergraduate degree and I went straight into a PhD program. And from a legal perspective, I, I had done a, a doctrinal law degree, which was fantastic degree, but it was very much based on the rules and the application of rules to facts. And so then I found myself uh, in the UK um, on a scholarship program doing a PhD, um, but perhaps not having the higher order thinking or the critical thinking skills that were necessary. Mm -hmm. So for the first year of my program, um, I was writing a, a, a PhD and I was really interested in community service orders. They're just a, a penal sanction. Uh, it was something that interested me and I actually I, I had done part of my final year project with Professor Paul McCutcheon on it. So I thought if it was good enough for him, it would be it would be good enough to do a PhD on. Um, and very often and particularly with uh, people, I say, like in, in law, I thought, well, I'll start my thesis. I'll start with the history section because that's, you know, th that's at least it, it, it won't be controversial. Uh, I, it's the context setting. And so that will be easy. But I had a brilliant um, PhD supervisor and you know, six months into my thesis, I recognized that I was crossing disciplinary boundaries and I was you know, engaging in what might only be described as is serious methodological f flaws. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, a, a historian will look at history um, as a dead past, you know, a, a, in terms of context and historical specificity, but a lawyer looks at it in terms of precedent and they can go back 300 years, traverse all sorts of boundaries and um, lift a precedent and take it into the present. And so the big methodological flaw with that is a thing called Whiggism or presentism. And so he stopped me in my tracks and said, this is all rubbish. Uh, you've gathered all of this history on work based penal sanctions going back to transportation and so on. But you need to understand it in its context, in terms of its historical specificity. And so that made me understand for the first time to start really critically engaging and thinking about change. Um, now, it was difficult, Michelle, initially, because you're now you're, you're now outside your comfort zone and you're also challenging yourself and saying, why didn't I know this? Or am I not good enough? 
And so you have all of these challenges and these, this range of knowledge that's out there that you're uncomfortable with, different epistemologies, methodologies, critical thinking methods and so on. Mm -hmm. And you have to find your way within that landscape. And that's what I had to do from start. And I remember thinking at the end of my first year, am I good enough to finish this? Um, and uh, and but slowly but surely when you, you know, that's the beauty that that uncomfortableness is where the real creativity is. Mm -hmm. And so that brought me back in to start reflecting on change, really owning my research. Um, and that then shaped, I would say, my academic career thereafter, because what I've become most interested in is change in the criminal process. And so change mm. to begin with, with the rise of the prison, um, which is relevant today, Michelle, because we had all of these carceral sites dotted around the country, psychiatric hospitals, Magdalene laundries, reformatory and industrial schools, prisons, borstals, inebriate detention centres, which is all part of a a penitentiary science emerging from the mid 19th century uh, onwards and then since then so so that had uh, you know uh, that was based on particular assumptions and commitments and mm -hmm. so then when you as a as a lawyer then starting to understand that and understanding the history and the sociology and the different dimensions of that um and and you know since then uh, that's been a large priority is looking at change in the criminal process and where that's led me most recently michelle um, mm. And having never thought about it, is the victim in the criminal process and the complainant in the criminal process. Um, and then starting to juxtapose. So for 150 years, I would say from the early 19th century right through to the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, it's been a very state accused model. Okay. Central state ranged against the accused, mm -hmm. rights for the accused um, and then powers for the state. And that's how I learned as an undergraduate student. But of course, missing from the narrative entirely was the complainant or the victim, that they weren't a stakeholder that mattered really at all. But what's been interesting then as I, as I get older and my hair gets grayer, it's just beginning to see for the first time yeah. uh, again how the victim is re-entering criminal discourse uh, mm -hmm. in, in a whole variety of different ways, and be it in terms of doctrinal rules like around evidence and criminal law, uh, criminal procedure, but also then around accommodation, uh, information provision, and actually beginning to see uh, see them as a rights bearer and a rights holder in the criminal process. But it's only through, I suppose, for me, the uncomfortableness mm -hmm. and the, the the going down those wrong paths, which are such an important part, I think, of a, a of a, a, a of a PhD journey. In fact. I will often say to my PhD students, I mean, you judge a good work by how much work you throw away. You know the way sometimes a student yeah. would say, well, I have 50,000 words done now. And I will often say, well, how many words have you thrown away? Because it, it yeah. and it's it, your thesis will be better the more the more you're throwing up, thrown away. And it's uncomfortable. It's difficult. It's challenging yeah. personally. But I think that's where the real growth is. That's really interesting advice. You know what you just touched upon there of what we do throw away or how we own our research as well. But Shane, you really, you know, you speak so passionately about your area of expertise and it's a joy to to hear that, you know. Um, but one question that I wanted to ask um, based on that is why going back to, you know, when you move from the undergraduate to PhD, why did you choose the UK? Where did this idea come from and would you prefer to stay in Ireland maybe? Yeah, I absolutely would have preferred to stay in Ireland at the time. Um, I was finishing my law degree. I was unsure about what to do next. And to be honest, um, Michelle, and this is something that it happens to people. I mean, you know, people assume that you make rational choices about where you go and what you do next. But sometimes, you know, we make uh, very quick decisions about uh, big life choices and we can take you can procrastinate longer over buying a pair of jeans than sometimes you do about a, a decision. So what really happened to me is I was finishing my law degree. I was unsure about what to ne do next. Back in the late 80s, early 1990s, there wasn't a lot of opportunity um, in the law field. It's completely different now. Um, and a P do I started to apply to to do master. I, I love the idea of teaching. And so I started to apply to different institutions and uh, I wrote letters at the time that's it wasn't email contact and uh, to all over the UK and uh, one of the institutions I contacted was the University of Wales Aberystwyth this fabulous university it's like the NUI 
three universities in Wales, Aberystwyth is, 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 is one of them, it's on the coast. And they wrote back and said, look, you know, would you be interested in coming for an interview for a PhD? And it that's awesome. simply how it started. And I found myself then on a PhD trajectory. But it, it, it was because of um, having n- not so much other choice uh, that I ended up. But I'm but actually what in, interestingly, what, what happened then, Michelle, is that after I got that offer, I also got an offer then to be a an apprentice solicitor and then I then it fo- focused me what do I want to do so I choose chose academia and ended up going down that route but again I would also say Michelle on that that I'm also really glad that I went to the UK and the reason why I'm glad again uh, I was leaving everything I knew behind so all my friends um mm-hmm. you know my partner who's now my wife everybody was being left behind and you're going to, and it's a solitary experience I mean a PhD journey as you know mm-hmm. Is very solitary um but i can honestly say that uh, two great things happened in the uk for me in, in wales and in um one was the obviously the phd and it's not so much the substantive content which we've already talked about it was more the skill set that, that you get from doing a phd so that's the first thing but again it's hard it's about resilience it's about you know uh, taking the time to trash out that question work through the methodologies th- throw away so much work but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that was the the, the skill sets around that and actually learning how to write properly michelle um i can honestly say and i don't know why it was possibly be me but you know through the secondary school system as well and perhaps through university not really doing the topping and tailing and the crafting that was that was yes. necessary around writing um but i really learned that in the uk and the second thing i learned and that has really stood me in good stead was i was in a big academic system then and Mm -hmm. Um, My colleagues in the Department of Law that I was in in the UK was fully embraced, but I learned my craft as an academic, how to teach, how to, you know, be a leader leader in terms of administration, you know, being course director, you know, the engagements around meetings, how to be in those meetings. There's a craft around all of that, conferences and so on. So you get the exposure to all of that and you kind of learn your craft. And for me, learning my craft in the UK, although it was difficult because you're outside, you're entirely outside your comfort zone again. Um, people struggled with my accent. Um, you know, I had no network. You have to learn all of that. But I came back to Ireland then. And at the time, many people in law didn't have a PhD. Um, so I went to UCC, worked in UCC for a number of years. I started initially, the, you know, in Waterford Institute of Technology, then, then, then went to UCC. But I felt that I had that exposure that I had uh, really helps me. Um, and so again, we talked about the PhD journey being one of uncomfortableness. It absolutely is. But also being in another jurisdiction in another university was also uncomfortable. But that's where the real growth was for me. And it has stood me in good stead throughout my career. Absolutely. I think many of our PhD students listening to this podcast now today can relate to this moving to a new country. You know, um, you had big decisions to make, you know, between moving to a new country, leaving behind your friends, your family. And, you know, you're in a brand new area, brand new cohort. And as you say, all the skills that you learned in crafting the trade as such, um, it's fantastic. And then coming back to Ireland afterwards and how that maybe gave you competitive advantage as well, having that experience experience in the UK. There's so, no question, sorry Michelle on that, you, everything you synopsize it brilliantly, but there's no question that you do gain a competitive advantage ultimately. But what I think that people who are listening to the podcast, what they need to understand is that it is, and I didn't know this at the time, but it is very, it's lonely. I used to look on endlessly at, there was thought postgraduate students uh, who were in the same discipline. And I used to look they, they had a network because they had each other and right. I felt outside that loop, even though I got on well with them and so on. And, um, you know, a PhD is to some extent, it's a it's a relationship with your supervisors and it is a, it's 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 mm-hmm. more isolating and you're not working to a set curriculum. So all of the anchors that you're used to, your community of, of, of students that, are, you know, scholars that you're working with are your 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 set curriculum. All of that is taken away. And so you're working with a blank page. You have no network around you. You're on your own. Um, and that's hard. That is very difficult. Mm-hmm. But if you can actually, if you can sit with that and understand the growth that will come ultimately through working your way through, through car- carving out that niche, um, 
I think that it will serve you well personally in terms of your own personal journey, professionally, um, you know, as well. And that's mm-hmm. definitely true for me. That's really great advice for everybody listening today. So thank you so much for that. And I actually just want to touch upon professional role models. You must have had some professional role models, even thinking back to your PhD or when you moved into a more professional um, you know, position. Are there any specific professional role models that you, you know, that really had an impact on you, Shane, throughout your career or way back during your PhD? Well, Michelle, that's an outstanding question. And, um, you, you know, if you think about everybody in terms of their personal journeys, if you think about the people who who shaped your careers and shaped your choices, I mean, I had a fantastic history school teacher in secondary school that really shaped me. I had brilliant really? lecturers in in the university in Limerick. I had, you know, Professor Paul McCutcheon, Professor Ray Freel, Owen Quill. They shaped me and they, they gave me a love of teaching. But then I went to the UK. I had an outstanding supervisor. He was old Oxford academic who was who loved living in West Wales and um, he was um, in a lovely style and he knew there was this raw individual from the west of Ireland who <laughs> who, who was probably quite shy and um, and he wanted me like he teased out that you know he, 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 he his, his supervision was individualized and yeah. he, he used to say things to me like I, I to begin with I found the critical engagement difficult because I didn't want to criticize others, you know, you know, in, in, in work. I just found that difficult because I think it was almost a humility. Who am I to criticize anybody? But what he would do then is he teased that out and he said, no, I want you to put something silly in your next section for me. I want you to say something silly. And let's let's start from the perspective that uh, it's silly and it's critical. Put it in and we'll work through it. But he was just that was his way, individual way of dealing with my personality. I think that for me was fantastic and I actually understand having done all these PhD supervisions myself now each one is individualized it has to be tailored to the to the personality of the supervisee and you can't you can't have a an algebraic formulaic approach to to how you do a supervision so he, he taught me that and he taught me about also about generosity that you know some of the best engagements are are the ones with your PhD students and with your students that they are the ones that that's what academia is very much about so that was one example and then when i went to work in ucc um i i agreed i had a great head of department there professor caroline fennell and she was just outstanding and she was generous in her approach um and was and it was confident in her approach and was really about appointing people and letting them run and i loved that idea leadership style um kind of worked for me and then i had a colleague as well just professor siobhan malali um and, you know, she was a great peer mentor for me in terms of being an academic and how to be an academic, particularly around PhD supervision, but also around scholarship and engagement with stakeholders. And Siobhan now is the director of the Human Rights Centre in, in NUI Galway. But it was just it's it's lovely to have a, a colleague like that, that you can actually um, that you could, you know, as a friend, but also to, to look at them and to to, to 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 watch them. And then more recently, like, you know, having come to UL um, and. Yeah. You know, you see people, I mean, it's not just all about academia either. I mean, Pat, Dr. Pat Phelan is he is um, director of the academic registry. And just you learn from individuals like that about integrity and professionalism and how they go about their job and how they collaborate with others. I think you can learn so much from that. Um, and uh, I think our president, uh, you know, I'm learning, you know, now from uh, Professor Kirsten May, you know, about human centered leadership and the energy that she has, the creativity that she has um, and, you know, how to collaborate with people through that human centred approach. So you you mm. you have to be open to that. But I think that you're learning all the time and and you have to be willing to, to learn all the time. I do not have all the answers. You, you, you can pick up on people's styles. You can pick up on what they do. You can also perhaps learn most, Michelle, I think that in difficult situations, ha- watching how people manage. And that's why um, I mentioned to you at the outset that uh, one of the things that I got taught in Aberystwyth very early on was attending meetings. Now, many people will say, oh, meetings, that's just the ad- ad- administrative side. And, you know, the, exci- the teaching is more exciting or the research is more exciting. But you'll also learn from how to articulate a point of view, 
how to get a policy through, how to respond in a difficult situation, how to engage in teams and, and make decisions, the formality of it, but also the good governance. So all of that is part, also part of the craft of academia. And I would my, my advice to PhD students is that learning that is, is like, don't dismiss it either, because I think it will stand you in good stead as you go through your career and you will learn from different people about how they chair meetings. I mean, I even commented to you, Michelle, about how you chaired the event, the summer school last week. But it's just those observations. You you have to be engaged to see how that happens. And you have to, it's a little bit like, um, it's a growth mindset as well, whereby it's sometimes in the, it's in the challenging circumstances that may arise in the meeting. And sometimes doing badly in meetings or having something shot down or, 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 or not having a submission accepted and understanding that there's growth there for people as well. Again, Shane, really great advice. And just to see the wide array of role models that you've had, you know, you touched upon all the way back from the history teacher that you had in secondary school through your PhD in Wales. And again, back more recently in UCC, in uh, UL, it's great to see the wide array of, of you know, role models that you've had. It's fantastic to hear this. And you, you know, you speak so positively about these role models. But now you, in your own new role as Dean of Faculty of AHSS, you are a role model to many of your colleagues and us as PhD researchers. So it's great to see this as well and to acknowledge this, Shane. But really, I want to know um, what aspects of this new role are you most looking forward to? And it is, you know, an exciting role to undertake and obviously a huge commitment as well. But what are you most looking forward to of your new role as Dean of Faculty of AHSS? Well, Michelle, I, I, it, I could talk to you again. It's about it. It's and I hope this is helpful for PhD students because the when you start your career, my advice to you would be not to pigeonhole yourself um, and that you uh, when you like, particularly if you move into academia, that mm -hmm. be, it's that openness to to all the different components and all the different aspects of it. Um, so when I was in UCC, I was open, for example, to to different types of peer models, really interested in adding value to my teaching, adding value to my research um, and through administrative leadership. And I but I never thought uh, genuinely, I never thought that I would end up in a in a leadership role. And that has been honest. And I never had actually it was not a, an expectation or a want that that I desired for myself. Mm -hmm. I was perfectly happy to to move through the 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 academic route, if that makes sense, through mm -hmm. senior lecture and uh, you know hopefully associate prof and and, mm -hmm. and professor role. And what actually happened in, 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 in my journey was that I was an associate professor in UCC and this job came up in the University of Limerick and personal circumstances and so on. It suited me. It was a closer commute and it's just suited me to, 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 to move into the chair role and the, in the University of Limerick, which I've really enjoyed. But then I was asked, OK, as part of this role, you have to be head of school. And I have to say to you, to be honest with you, I had sleepless nights over it because and it's not it's not about it's it's not the workload it's actually what if i let people down what if i undermine their careers what if i'm not able to deliver and uh and very they, honest yeah. yeah and these are the real concerns that how you know they that you know you you, you now have to act as you know can't think categorical imperative you you have to act in a way that you know your maxims are universal that you don't use people as a means to an end that you 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 have to create community and you have to support that community and ensure that 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 people people's careers and 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 at PhD level right through that uh, you know professional support academics that they're not damaged and that you can help all of them and having had no experience you you fall into the role and then you find your way and I think what was really important is the role, the mentors that you talk about, the professional role models, knowing what other people did and seeing that and then observing it in, in the people that I was coming across in the University of Limerick, that becomes important. And then finally, as part of that, then then you learn through hard work to kind of back yourself. And as long as you're making decisions, I mean, I made lots of wrong decisions, Michelle, but, you know, I was always doing it from a place of good faith, trying to do the right thing. And I think the most important thing that I've learned is it's about service leadership. And what I mean by that is that if you're in the job as a leader, 
that if you're being of service to others, and that's what it's about. I mean, sometimes people think about mm-hmm. leadership, that it's others should be serving you. It's the actual re- reverse. It is completely the reverse. It's you are meant to serve other people. And that acronym that is really helpful to me um, is HOPE, H-O-P-E, which is help other people excel. And I think that in particular in academia um, and in academic communities, that's mm-hmm. what it should be about. And it should be about you know, helping disciplines excel, supporting them, understanding the nuances of disciplines, but then also helping, you know, academics and professional support staff to excel in their roles uh, as part of a community. You see, we we do work to some extent, Michelle, in isolation in terms of our own individual trajectories as as PhD scholars and you move on. But mm-hmm. ultimately, we're part of communities and it's yeah. to support those communities. Mm-hmm. And I think that that, you know, I suppose that's what I try to do in the law school. And then the role came up as dean, and again, you know, I I have to say that you know, I liked the leadership role in the school of law. I liked um, shaping and crafting and working with people and the collaboration. Now that's not to say it's not a hundred percent easy. Two days in the week you might find it really difficult, but the three, but the good days outweigh the bad days. And the really good days is when you see staff producing you know, engagement with st- external stakeholders, students coming through in a programme, PhD supervision completions, yeah. um, successes, funding successes, all of the things that you can actually share in and the excitement that brings and then not knowing where to go next, it, it, you know, because that's the excitement about, scholar- I think, working in university as well is that no two days are the same. And, mm-hmm. you know, a book gets completed, a book contract gets received, a new tender is brought in, new curriculum is introduced. It's changing all the time and that's really exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then the, the role came up uh, as executive dean, and I have to say I've had the same sleepless nights um, <laughs> over that. And and it is because it's a different type of challenge. So I obviously understood law, um, and I understood a little bit with, say, for example, history and sociology, given all the all of my failures in terms of you know for it, with my PhD and so on, and working into that. But it's trying to ensure then that you do exactly the same across a much broader landscape um, to support, to help um, and 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 to do so authentically. You know, it's not yeah. it, it's it's OK. It's very easy to say the right things, um, but it's tokenistic. It's actually doing the right things um, and and genuinely supporting in the background. And it doesn't have to be seen, but it's, it's actually just trying to create that culture. And I think if I can, what I, I suppose if there's one outcome that I would like at the end of my deanship, it would be that that we have a that um, and it's not to say that it's not already in place, but what I you know that we have that collegiality, that we retain that community of scholarship, that everybody feels that their work is recognised um, and that they're supported. And uh, so that would be what I see as very important. There's nothing massively original, Michelle, in what I've said to you there. Um, but it's actually if your we could still do that. Yeah, it's absolutely your own point of view, like you, what you bring to this position and make it your own. What you just said, that really resonated with me. It's it's a joy to hear that, you know. So thank you again for, for all of that. I think it's great insight, even for us as PhD researchers. You know, it, you build upon the sense of community and how we can add to that. I think that's really important. So thank you for sharing that with us. But Shane, I suppose a final question today. You spoke a lot about managing all the different aspects that's involved in your role right now and up until now, you know. And if I relate that to us as PhD students, academic careers present specific challenges in achieving balance, be it um, teaching, research, administration. There's so many different aspects involved. And how do we achieve work-life balance? That's a critical question. So would you have any advice um, to us all as PhD researchers or to yourself maybe, um, or your younger self, how do you achieve work-life balance? I I saw your question in advance and I actually, it's a brilliant question on how to do it. Um, I, I think to begin with, I have some suggestions, but I, I, I'd start with the perspective is that academia is a long, you know, it's a, the long jura, uh, the uh, Annalise School of History used to talk about, which, you know, the, uh, over a long period of time. And mm-hmm. I think you have to view your career, um, you know, you have to have the mindset that um, this does take time and it's going to take time to build your career. Um, so you have to allow yourself that time. Um, and I, what I would say to you to begin with is that, for me, 
there are three pillars and there's the three pillars have always been in place. And it, our, I talked to you earlier, Michelle, even prior to the interview, we talked about, you know, having the kettle boiling. Um, well, yeah. there's three kettles. There's three pots that need to be on the boil all the time, but they may they may be at different heats. But so the first one is obviously your research. Uh, so you're going to be passionate about your research. You have to maintain that. But within over a five, six, seven year period, you will have at, at some times you will have intense outputs because some a project will be coming to an end. At another time, it's the slow research periods where you're actually building, you're learning new material, you're going down new pathways. Mm-hmm. Um, and that takes time. And mm-hmm. so you have to allow yourself that to, to, to that to, to um, at, you know, allow that slow learning time, mm-hmm. that research mm-hmm. space to build and then but, but also be sufficiently strategic to know that I need to keep the kettle boiling um, or the pot boiling, as it were. Um, and I used to mix that by sometimes the more philosophical, socio-legal material takes longer um, and it takes me longer anyway, because I might need to read in new areas or, or yes. and so on. And that takes me time. Um, whereas then the more doctrinal material around criminal law or evidence law, I can get that out quicker. So mm-hmm. sometimes it's having a plan, but a long term plan of saying, OK, I'm reading this material that's going to take time. But I'm also I, I can do this more quickly and it's almost having a couple of things in your research portfolio on the go. So that's the first thing, but mm-hmm. allowing yourself the time that it's going to take time, but you can still be strategic within that. that that's the first issue. So that's right. the first pillar. Mm-hmm. And I would say then as well as part of that pillar. And this is something that I struggled with initially is, uh, you know, being shy and it, which is crip, can be crippling uh, the stakeholder in getting to know other scholars is very important across you know across the globe really and you do that through going to conferences and so on and i used to find initially i'd go to the conference give my paper and leave um uh, because i'd find it so hard uh, to to sit around yeah but i think that that's a mistake and again it's uncomfortable but live with the uncomfortableness get to know the right people they can help you and they can also champion your work um, uh, so that time you put into that is very, very important as part of the research trajectory, that mm-hmm. networking. And it can be at a very, it can be at a you know local level in the university, it can be at a national level, it can be at interna- international level, but keep that in mind. The second pillar is teaching. Um, so as an academic, you are going to be required, and particularly in the arts, humanities and social sciences, you're going to have to teach. Um, so, and it's, it's, Teaching is wonderful because you get to shape uh, so many different people. So it should be embraced as a fantastic thing and it should be done in that spirit and in that light. So mm-hmm. you, but you go, it's going to take you a little bit of time to get into the right areas of your teaching. So as an example, I mean, I, I never got to teach criminal law in UCC because it was, you know, there was other academics who were before me there and I could could teach it in in, UCC, in in UL, but it takes time to get into your specific area. And sometimes you mm-hmm. have to create your own your own curriculum. So when I came to UL, what I talked to you about there is penology and victimology. I introduced that module because I wanted to teach it linked in with my research expertise. So mm-hmm. I suppose what I'm saying to you as a young careerist is that initially it may take you time to fall into your specific area of teaching that you want but that's okay you should be prepared to teach across a broad spectrum to begin with as i did and then ultimately you end up where you need to be that's the second thing so teaching and then the third thing michelle that i talked to you about is administrative leadership um and so it's again i would encourage um you know PhD scholars and, and your early career academics is to be also open to that possibility. And I spoke to you in the beginning about learning my craft by attending meetings and you in the UK and you become a course director. And then you should think about how can I add value to this course directorship? How can I benefit the students? But ultimately, how can I benefit my discipline as well? And there's always new things you can do, like focus groups or you might introduce um, a, a, a a, a WhatsApp network group around it, create an alumni network around it. Mm-hmm. So it's been creative in terms of the value you add. And then so that's you developing your leadership portfolio. And then as part of that, you can network. So I, I think I mentioned Pat Phelan earlier on. 
I got to know Pat Phelan through leadership work that I was involved in um, with Angarda Shiokona. Um, and, and that's all part of that networking, the leadership portfolio you develop. So they're the three pots that need to be boiling. You, they will boil at different rates, um, but it's keeping all three in mind. I've two, I've probably taken up too much time, but I, the other thing that I would say to you is, is resilience. Michelle, it's, it's very like, as a PhD student, the most important skill in my opinion is not cognitive ability or competency. It's actually to do with resilience. It's staying the course and that's difficult. And particularly when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, which I didn't see in my first year, you know, you're working through something, but you can't see it, but then you almost reach a portal uh, in the last 12 months or eight, eight to 12 months and you're you're on the downslope and then it becomes much easier. But it's working through that and it's resilience that will get you through it. But it's also resilience that will get you the first step on the academic ladder ladder of a post. And so for a number of years, you might have to do a postdoc, you're in temporary positions. All of that is hard. But my attitude to you there again is, and I, I really believe this, is that mm-hmm. um, the person who won't go away is the most competitive advantage of all. You know, the person who just won't be denied, who will stay with it, um, and who will keep pushing the research agenda, keep pushing their teaching agenda. They will get the post, but they deserve the post and it will come. So don't give up um, and it can happen. And I also think that, you know, careers in universities, uh, be it, you know, hybrid models where you're half in academia, say half in professional support, fully in academia or fully in professional support. They're wonderful careers because you're working in, in the main, you're working with young people and they give you an energy and you can shape and help and uh, you, you, you know, create outcomes for them that, that will help them in their lives. And ultimately, that's a fantastic place to work and it's a fantastic place to be. And also, it's lovely to be around ideas. And if you think about it, Michelle, yeah. uh, you, know, what, you know, I was in your summer school last week. If it, it's all it is, is ideas and exchanging ideas, yes. working with ideas. And that's it's brilliant to be around that on a daily basis. So I think that resilience um, and accepting that if you if you want it, it will come like and, and you st- you stay with it. I mean, I think that yeah. one of the things that really strikes me with academia is that in probably no other sphere of professional life do people question themselves as much. I think that academics are very hard on themselves. They're very critically reflective of their of themselves. And I think it's probably because um, they're being judged all the time. They're being judged in terms of the work they submit for journals. It's been rejected. There'll be, you know, uh, you know, so the, all, all of this happens as part of the academic cycle. Uh, and but I think that except all that, that's part of the process. Don't let it. I mean, it bothered me initially greatly. And actually, sometimes I would set the bar too low. So I I, yeah. I wouldn't go for the top journal because I feel it might be rejected. So I'll go for a middle tier journal. But the work when I look back was good enough, if that makes any sense. Yes. And it, yeah. And, but I ultimately didn't sometimes didn't didn't go for the top tier journal. My advice to you would be aim for the stars. You're bound to hit the lamppost and that's good enough. You know, but, but start out initially with with uh, where you want to get to um, and don't don't worry about rejection. It's part of the game. The quicker that you learn that, the better. Shane, that is just fantastic advice. Very honest and very open advice today for all of our PhD researchers and many more listening to this today. So I want to thank you sincerely. And as you say, um, shoot for the stars. You know, that was a nice ending to this today. But even those three pillars, as you mentioned, time, give yourself time, be open to networking and also the pillar of teaching and administration, you know, gain experience in this. I have learned so much from our discussion today. So I want to thank you, Shane, for giving us the time. And I think this is going to be a really popular podcast. We'll have many different listeners to this today. Um, So I can't wait to publish it. Shane, again, sincere thank you from all of us. Pleasure, Michelle. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you.